If you're a fan of softball, then you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show sponsored by Easton Sports. Now the man that knows more about softball than anyone on the planet, your host, Gary Leland. Yes, it's me, Tara, again. Welcome to the Fast Pitch TV show. If you're watching us on YouTube, MySpace, or any other video sharing website, please don't for forget to check out our website at fastpitch.tv. It's the place where you can find all of our past episodes and the place to keep you updated on our future episodes. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Easton Sports. The truth is, there's a difference. The difference is Easton. You can also go and check out their website at eastonsoftball.com. Before I go on with this week's show, I want to go ahead and announce that the Fast Pitch TV show has been nominated for Podcast of the Year. That's right. We are one of the top 10 finalists in the sports category of the Podcast Awards. I am asking all of our fans to go to podcastawards.com and vote for us. You can vote once a day until November the 30th, so any love you can bring us will be greatly appreciated. Now back to this week's show. Professional fast pitch softball player and pitching coach Bill Hillhouse returns. Gary went to his pitching clinic Bill was hosting a few weeks ago. Bill was so happy with his previous appearances on Fast Pitch TV, how they turned out, that he let Gary film the entire one-hour clinic. This is a great opportunity for you to see one of the top pitching coaches in the country giving his clinic. Since the clinic is over an hour, I'm going to bring it to you in three parts, about 20 minutes each. So let's go to episode one of the Bill Hill House Pitching Clinic. Let me tell you a little bit about me um, personally, is that I've never played a game of baseball in my life. 37 years old, I've never played a single game of baseball in my life. I've only ever played softball, fast pitch softball. Uh, as a kid, I was growing up, and my dad played softball, fast pitch, and I pitched on the sidelines as the bat boy, and I never stopped. It's basically how it is. Some people would say I still imitate the pitchers. That's uh, it's basically how I got started, and I never stopped, and I just kept going with it and going with it and going with it, and I first started playing in men's leagues at home when I was 12 years old, and I said it. When Gary interviewed me a couple weeks ago, fathom that, putting a 12-year-old girl into a women's fast pitch league. A 12-year-old girl into a women's, and that's what I had to go through as a 12-year-old boy playing against grown men, college baseball players, former professional league baseball players. It was trial by fire. It really was. And, you know, <clears throat> the thing that I do the most that I think is beneficial for me is I demonstrate as I'm doing it. I don't just sit here. This is what I want you to do. I'll actually show them, and I explain to them what happens if they don't do it this way. Uh, I do believe that there is a right way and a wrong way to pitch, and I make no apologies about that. I believe our bodies are designed to work a certain way, and we have to get them to work that certain way. Male and female, our bodies work the same way. We teach our girls to throw overhand the exact same way as boys when they're playing shortstop. Swings now are being taught identical. Boys and girls hitting baseball versus softball. It's identical. Pitching softball should not be any different. A lot of people want to tell you that girls need to be pitching different than boys because men are so much stronger than boys, or men are so much stronger than girls. And you know, I, I always look at myself and go, well, where, where's the muscle? I mean, this is not about strength. If this was about strength, I would not look like this. Okay? This is about getting an understanding of how our bodies are designed to work. And the reality of it is, is what a lot of girls are taught to do from the state, from the start of their pitching career, really is going to be prohibitive of what they're going to be able to do later in the pitching career. An example of that is wrist flips. You see girls doing wrist snaps prior to warming up. And as coaches, you guys probably see a lot of that. And I always ask girls, you know, well, what are you doing when you do this? And nine times out of ten, they, they just look at you and they give you a deer in the headlights look and they go, I don't know. And then there's always that one out of ten that say, well, I'm warming up my wrist. And I say, okay, well, did you throw overhand before you started? I say, yeah. So, okay, well, in terms of just your wrist action alone, is this the same as this, just upside down? And they say, well, yeah. So then you already warmed up your wrist, right? Well, yeah, I guess I did. Okay, so then what are you doing? And then they're back to square one. I don't know. And the reality is, is when they're doing this, what they're actually teaching themselves to do is to pitch with their wrist only. There was a girl at the park tonight who was giving pitching lessons when I was giving lessons, and she was on the other side, and she was really emphasizing about a wrist snap. And wrist snap is important, but the problem is, is when you overdevelop the wrist, you underdevelop the other parts of the arm. 
If a pitcher stands here and teaches themselves to do wrist snaps, whether it be sideways or forwards, they're actually teaching themselves to pitch with a locked arm. Have you ever seen a baseball pitcher warm up going like this? No, because they need their elbow to bend and snap. I need my elbow to bend and snap. And it's counterproductive to teach myself not to use my elbow. It's actually teaching them to pitch with a straight arm instead of a loose whip action that you need, just as if you were throwing the ball overhand. Basically, in the simplest definition, throwing the ball underhand is throwing the ball overhand upside down. Take a lot of the same principles and you can turn the overhand motion into the underhand motion. <clears throat> One of the more common things that gets taught is the follow through of girls and it gets really, really enforced to them and then ingrained in their head that they need to finish with their elbow pointed straight up to the catcher. And if you just take what I said a second ago that the overhand motion, is the underhand motion is the overhand motion turned upside down, then if this was right, then when you threw a ball overhand, you'd be going like this. And there isn't anything that we do in any sport in the world where your power is done straightforward. Everything is done across your body, no matter what sport you play. Whether you box, your jabs are straight, you're going to knock somebody out, you come across your body. Another analogy for them would be volleyball. They throw the ball up, they don't go like this, they go and they spike across their body. Their elbow, hips, Every part of their body needs to twerk and snap across. Same thing in pitching. We need to come across our body, not straight up. Nine times out of ten, a pitcher who does this motion is going to have a tendency, if they're right-handed, to pitch inside to a right-handed batter. The reason for that is very simple, and I'm going to get to that in just one second. But again, this is, this is all what I'm talking about, about understanding how our bodies are designed to work. And it's, it's not rocket scientists. I did not invent how to do this. I did not reinvent the wheel here. I'm not the only person who knows how to do it. I'm just telling you that what a most of these, what, a, what you see a lot of these girls being taught, when you think about it and you break it down and you, you compare what they're doing versus what you see the best pitchers in the world doing, it's night and day. It is night and day. I mean, if you watch the Women's College World Series on ESPN and you watch how these girls are pitching and then you compare that to what Kat Osterman is doing or Angela Tincher, the, the best pitchers in the world, they're not doing the same things. And it just makes you, why would you do something that you don't see the best in the world doing? It makes no sense to me. The only answer to that is that what happens a lot of times is people confuse their personal pitching style with the only way to pitch. They will teach their own personal pitching style as gospel. That's the way we have to do it. Absolutes and styles. Those two phrases are going to be said quite a bit. Because there's styles that you use and there's absolutes. In certain points in my motion, I'm going to be in identical positions as cat Osterman. Identical. How we get into those positions is very different. Osterman brings the ball up, comes down. Personally, I see absolutely no point in bringing the ball up over my head when I've got to come back down and go all the way back up again. Okay? She likes to do that. God bless her. But ultimately, she does this to get herself into this position right here. Well, I have to do that. I just stand right there. We're in the same position now. Exact same position. Leg is loaded. Waist is flexed. Knee is bent. Hands is back. We're ready to explode off the rubber, but I didn't bring the ball up over my head. Style choice. She does this. I don't do that. One's no more right than the other. It's just what we choose to do. Okay? Like I said, we need to get into certain positions. How we get into those positions is up to us. Now, what happens a lot of times is when people teach their style as an absolute, well, it doesn't fit. My body type is a little bit different than a 12-year-old than a girl's, obviously. Okay? So what I choose to do with my motion might be different than what she chooses to do, but again, ultimately, we need to end up in the same positions. There's no and ifs, or buts about it. Just as there's a correct way to throw a ball overhand, a correct way to swing a bat, there's a correct, there's a correct way to do this underhand, too. Again, I, I get chastised for saying things like that because there's right and there's wrong. If you watch what the best do, they're all doing the same things. Now, there's a pretty simple philosophy that I use when I'm instructing a pitcher. It doesn't matter if she's 12 years old or if she's 18 years old. That simple philosophy is, is that if they throw the ball high or low, it means they have a timing problem. If they throw the ball inside or outside, they have a mechanics problem. Okay? And if they can understand those two things, those two principles about timing and mechanics, then they're going to be 
light years ahead of most pitchers and be able to fix most of their own problems. Inside pitches for a right-handed batter, right-handed pitcher to a right-handed batter. Nine times out of ten, this is because as they come around, they bring their hip and their hand through at the exact same time, forcing them to go around their body, pushing the ball inside to a right-handed batter. Well, that coincides with what the motion is that most of them are taught from the beginning. Most of them are taught hip and hand at the exact same time, bring the elbow point straight up to the catcher. And again, now, forget for a second about the, how our bodies move and how we're going to get a snap out of our elbow. This is a bend of the elbow versus a snap of the elbow across the body. But as they go around their body, they're automatically going to be pushing the ball inside to a right-handed batter. Not only does this affect their control, but it's going to make it impossible for them to throw a rise ball later in life. Not my rule. Didn't invent it. Just telling you how it's going to work. Now, inside pitches are because of the hip. Outside pitches are because of our shoulder. As we come around, if my shoulder's offline, the ball's going to be offline. Bring your shoulder back in line, ball goes straight. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. Inside pitches because of the hip, outside pitches because of the shoulder. The girls can remember that. They're going to be probably nine-tenths of the way to being able to self-correct most of their problems. In that same spirit, it needs to be said, well, why are they doing this? Well, how can they fix whatever's broken here? There's, cause there's, it's all well and good to say, well, this is what they're doing, but how do we correct it? Well, that is a little bit trickier because everybody does things a little bit differently. And it's really hard to diagnose everybody and make a generalization of how to fix most things without having an actual example here. A pitcher who has a tendency, for example, to throw their shoulder out all the time and they throw way over, over outside to a right-handed batter, most of the time when they do that, it's because their glove hand is swimming. Looks like they're doing a breaststroke. As soon as that glove hand leaves the line of the body, the shoulder goes out. You bring that shoulder right back in line, ball goes straight. So how do you fix it? Well, there's one of two ways. You either have her put her glove on, puts her glove on right here, and she throws the ball into her own glove. She can do this in the house with a ball of socks. She can do it outside with a real ball. Right into her own glove. If she swims out with her arm, she's going to be nowhere near being able to catch that ball. And she's going to throw the ball. She's not going to be able to catch it. She'll have to bring that glove hand in, which is obviously going to bring the shoulder in. So she does that repetitiously over and over again. She can be working on multiple things at the same time. By multiple things, I'm talking about elbow snap. She can be not only not swimming, snapping the ball into her own glove, getting used to the whip of her elbow. We don't force the elbow to the opposite shoulder, but it needs to snap. It needs to finish across the body. I don't care if the hand finishes here. I don't care if the hand finishes here. It needs to have a snap of the elbow. Boom. She does that 50 times a night, she'll have that problem fixed in about 10 days. She won't be doing this. She'll have to be able to catch her own ball. You want to get a little bit more aggressive? Put her right up against the wall like this. And then the minute she tries to throw her hand out, she's going to whack the wall. It'll only take once. It will only take once for her to whack that wall before she's going to know. She's got to keep the glove in line with the body. Picture's thrown inside. How do we fix the inside problem? Well, depends on why it's broken. The verbiage that I use the most in trying to get a pitcher to keep the ball from going around their hip is to make the inside part of their forearm touch the belly button. If the forearm touches my belly button, the ball's going to go wherever my shoulder points. So then it's a matter of keeping the shoulder in line. Back to square one. If the shoulder goes out, ball goes out. Shoulder stays in, ball stays in. Forearm to the belly. Most of the pitchers who have a problem with bringing their hip and their hand through too soon, it means they're bringing their hip around for the ball, and they're going to twist it as they come around. They're not getting their arm up against their stomach. Well, this is a lot of the case because the follow-through that many of the girls are taught with the straight-up arm thing is also coincides with getting into the fielding position. What a lot of pitching coaches teach is they teach the fielding position to be almost as important as the pitch itself. And when this happens, girls are forcing themselves into this position, and as a result, they're not getting the pitch through correctly, and they're, they, they're so desperate to get into this position right here that they forget that the pitch has to come first. I try to tell pitchers that the pitch comes first, and then they fall into the fielding position. It's got to be a natural fall. Stay in line, hold the target, 
back knee should come up and touch the front knee or be pretty damn close. If those knees don't come together and stay in a straight line towards the target, and there's a gap in the knees, you're going to know automatically they went around the body. So, best thing to do with that, have them pitch in front of a mirror. Put a mirror on the back of the door, back of a, on a wall, anything. Stretch out a piece of masking tape right under a line, about eight feet long. And have them pitch right on that masking tape. As they look in their reflection, they're going to have that target that they're going to try to keep their foot right on top of that tape. If their foot goes off of that tape, they're going to know automatically, oh, well, I've got to keep my foot on. If they do it in a mirror, they're going to be able to see it instantly to keep their foot right on top. A mirror is one of the best things that a pitcher can do to fix a lot of muscle memory issues. Keeping that foot right on top is also going to prevent the pitcher from kicking their foot behind. If they do a bowler kick, well, we don't want to send our foot in an opposite direction to where I'm trying to throw the ball. It's sending our body two different directions. We're not going to have as much power going forward. I want everything to go in a line towards my catcher. So I want to teach the pitcher to go in a straight line with their drag, not around in a circle, not behind as a bowler, but straight up with my shoelaces pointed towards my target. If my shoelaces point to my target, that means I drag my tiptoe. I want to drag my tiptoe because I want to have the least amount of foot drag on the ground as humanly possible. More foot on the ground, more anchor holding them back. They are not going to be able to push out as far or as hard or as much if their whole foot is dragging on the ground. The idea is to get as much of their tiptoe on the ground as possible without having the whole side of their foot. As soon as their foot collapses and the toes point sideways, the shoelaces then point sideways, that means their whole foot's on the ground. Put the toe up, shoelaces point to the ground, now they're gliding. That's what we want. We, want to, we, we don't want that resistance on the ground, but according to the rules, we're supposed to be in contact with the ground. So the idea is to have the least amount of contact as possible. So, again, putting a piece of tape down into a line. Step on that tape, drag on that tape, back knee comes together, they fall into their fielding position. Okay? All of these things are pretty simple and pretty basic things that can be worked on at home and are big muscle memory things. And what happens, though, is a lot of times, is, especially in young ones, is they don't realize that the devil's in the details. The littlest thing, if they don't do it right, is going to affect what they're going to be able to do, or more importantly, what they're not going to be able to do later on. The rise ball is something that, in the pitching coach industry, or whatever you want to call it, uh, I have a little bit of notoriety for, because when I, and I, I'm very unapologetic about the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm very staunch in what I believe is to be right and wrong, but um, the rise ball is the true test for how our pitchers are doing. Because if one thing is wrong in the motion, we will not be able to get the ball to spin the right way. And there is a right and wrong way for the ball to spin on a rise ball. But because the mechanics that most, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of pitchers are being taught, because of the mechanics that most, or a lot of them are being, I almost said it again, a lot of them are being taught, doesn't allow them to be, even be able to spin the ball the right way. So as a result, you see pitchers leaning back and throwing the ball high. That's my rise ball. And they'll spin like a bullet. It doesn't spin backwards. It spins like a bullet. So they lean back and they throw the ball high and they say, look, that's my rise ball. No, that's not a rise ball. That's a high pitch. Just like if you throw it low, that's not a drop. That's a low pitch. If you throw it inside, that's not a screw ball. That's an inside pitch. You throw it outside, that's not a curveball, that's an outside. <sighs> it's, it's, it's maddening to me. It's absolutely maddening to me. Because what you see so many pitching coaches teach is they'll teach them to throw their drop like this. And then they're going to throw their rise ball like this. And then they're going to throw a screw ball like this. And then they're going to throw a curveball like this. All right. And then their fastball, they go like this. Now right there, I just demonstrated five different pitches with five different ways to pitch. Learning how to do this one way took me a lifetime. I can't even fathom learning it five different ways for five different pitches. It's, it, it, the, the concept is, is mind-boggling, but it gets accepted that this is the way we have to do it. Imagine, imagine again, putting this in, in baseball perspective for most of the day, most of the guys here are male, so putting this, in, imagine learning how to throw your fastball one way, and then on your curveball, instead of just spinning the ball a different way, you completely step out different and you do all kinds of crazy things with your motion. Well, not only are you keeping yourself, you're telegraphing the pitch, you're throwing yourself out of a potential rhythm, but you have to learn two different ways to pitch to throw two different pitches. And that's just, that's, that's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. 
Part of what a pitcher really needs to do is have as much rhythm as they can, and it's almost impossible to keep a rhythm when you're changing what you're doing from pitch to pitch. It really is. It's it, not my rule. It really isn't. But the rise ball, going back to it, if their motion is not right, they will not be able to get the ball to spin the right way. Now, there is absolutes and styles. Absolute is the rotation of the pitch. Style is how they choose to do it, how they choose to grip it. There is no right or wrong in how they choose to grip a ball. It makes absolutely no difference. But however they hold on to that ball, they better be able to get the same rotation that I can get on it. Because that's the important part. A drop ball spins straight forward. A rise ball should spin straight back or as close to straight back as possible. The motion that a lot of girls are being taught does not allow them to be able to spin the ball backwards. It doesn't. They spin it, and it looks like a bullet. You'll see the corkscrew. And there's a dot. ball spins right over the top of it. And that is because the motion that they're using is bringing the ball around their hip, and they twist instead of turn. The difference. Now, here's the difference when I say twist versus turn. One of the analogies that gets taught when girls are learning how to throw rise balls is they're taught that it's like turning a doorknob. And when they do that, they're teaching themselves that it's in the wrist more than the fingers. One of the analogies I prefer to use instead of using a doorknob is I say, it's like turning a light bulb. When you twist a light bulb, you use your fingertips, you don't use your wrist. If I turn my wrist too much on a rise ball, I'm going to get that corkscrew spin. If I keep my wrist straight and I snap my wrist with my hand coming underneath the ball properly, I'm going to be able to make the ball spin back. Bill, it was so kind of you to share your softball knowledge with all of us. Thank you. If you've never been to Bill's website, you can visit it at houseofpitching.com. He also has his videos for sale there as well. Don't forget to check out our website at fastpitch.tv. Become a fan of the show at facebook.com slash fastpitchtv. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash fastpitchtv. And don't forget to vote for us for the podcast awards every day until November the 30th at podcastawards.com. Now it's time to say goodbye. Let's end it with a word from our sponsor, Easton Sports, and thanks for watching. This bat's great, great pop, nice in the zone, feels good on the hands. The sweet spot is pretty nice on the smallest and other bats, even if you don't hit exactly on it, the ball still travels as far as it's supposed to.